Hello everybody and welcome to my channel. I am interviewing teen author Briar Esterline on the channel today. Briar has published a young adult supernatural thriller called Abelum Sanctuary over the summer and it is a fantastic, really super creepy read. Briar is a really wonderful author. We are talking today about horror craft stuff and how to use tropes and the different senses to heighten the fear factor in your horror. So if you're interested in learning how to write horror, I highly recommend sticking around till the end of this video and hearing what Briar has to say. So without further ado, let's welcome Briar Esterline to the channel. Could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. Um, my name is Briar Esterline and I'm actually an officially published author. I wrote Abelum Yay. Sanctuary and I just, uh, you know, I'm a horror writer that's a teen. So, so simply put. It's very impressive. I am so impressed by the fact that you are able to write such a fantastic book and publish it by yourself at 17. It's amazing. Um, yeah, Abelum Sanctuary is amazing. I absolutely flew through that book. It was the book that I think I read the fastest out of any book so far this year. What is your favorite thing about horror and what initially drew you to it? Why did you want to write horror? Um, I think what really draws me to horror is just how it's very uh, versatile. There's, you know, because not everyone is scared by the same thing. So it's very, there's a lot of room to work with. And I think what really, like as a kid, what appealed to me about it, what, uh, was like it was like the monster aspect of it you know what I mean like the the villain part you can make your villain this like super out there you know nightmarish thing and it kind of was acceptable within that genre if that makes sense right. yeah so there was a lot to work with in that genre I really that's what I really adore about it yeah well people have a lot of fears like there's so many oh. different things that people are afraid of <laughs> for sure I agree yeah, I I mean, for me, I, I I know I like, it's a way that I'm able to kind of calm my anxiety about the stuff that scares me is if I'm like able to explore it in horror and scary stuff in writing. And I can like mm -hmm. show characters battling it and overcoming it. It somehow makes everything slightly less scary to me. Horror is yeah. very interesting. Yeah. No, there's so much opportunity to play around with fear. <laughs> Absolutely. There's like, yeah. it's, it's abundant. Did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? I did. Uh, or at least in like when I finally hit that age of realizing I liked to create, I realized I wanted to write stories. So I, I think I would, I've, I'll, I've always known, I guess I'll say. When did you like start deciding that you wanted to write a book? 13. I think that's when I took it serious for the first time was like, I sat down and, you know, researched how books are made, you know, that they have a structure and stuff. So, you know, a lot of trial and error books came before Ablum. So I would say that kind of a 11, 12, 13 time frame. That's when I first wrote my actual books that right. had a coherent plot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are tons of books I've written that have absolutely non-coherent plots that are oh, all yeah. over the place and disasters. Yeah, yeah. They're very relatable. <laughs> what, did your, <laughs> <I miss. laughs> what did your writing education look like? Like when you decided that you wanted to write a book, what was the first thing that you did when you were trying to figure out how books are structured and what do you think was the thing that helped you the most? Um, I did a lot of like, I was very self-taught. I don't really, I didn't, I never took classes. I mean, I had English and stuff, but I relied on YouTube a lot through like a bunch of writer channels. Um, and I read a lot of books too on writing. Like I remember going to the library and just getting all the books I could mm -hmm. about writing and then just taking little nuggets of information from each of them. So it was all very self-taught and it was very organic you know, um, mainly reading too. I read a lot of books and I was like, oh, I like that phrase or I like how that, you know, yeah, metaphor is used. Yeah. yeah. So I kind of, I kind of picked what I liked and blended it into my own style so it could grow. Do you have so. favorite YouTube channels or favorite books that you referred to? Uh, Save the Cat is definitely in my tool belt always. Yeah. If any, if any authors ever like, hey, what book? I'm like, Save the Cat. It's Save the Cat writes a novel specifically because it's based off the mm -hmm. Save the Cat um, screenplay right. method, but I also like to watch Jenna Moresi on YouTube. She has definitely been, she's been the, you know, she's, uh, led me through the road to writing. I also like Kim Chance is another, uh, author yeah. YouTuber that I like. And what's her name? Alexa Dunn. There's a lot of thriller videos. I love watching yeah, thriller yeah. stuff. Yeah. So those three were kind of the holy trinity of, uh, younger me learning how to write. 
<laughs> and so I, I owe it all to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, so much of learning how to write is actually sitting down and doing it and experimenting too. Like mm -hmm. you really can't learn to write without reading a ton and writing a ton. Oh. I did the same thing as you. I used to just like pick out sentences and ways that people describe things out of books that I liked. And I would like keep a yeah. Word document and I'd type like just all these little physical descriptors in there. <laughs> And then when I was writing, if yeah. I was like, I need a way to describe this, I'd go back and I'd refer to the sentence yeah. list that I had. And eventually they kind of became ingrained in my head. So now I have some like really, really specific habits mm -hmm. when I'm writing, yep. which Me is too. Yeah. I'm like, oh, it's just if if it like if it's sensory, sensory wise, if it makes me like, oh, that was a really nice way to put it. Yeah. It's highlighted and put in a notebook for later because. Yeah, I can't live without it. Yeah, it's it's it, it's so helpful like that, and also like I used to write with the emotion thesaurus when I or, or, like oh, I don't know that that book that had all of the different ways to describe certain feelings mm -hmm. and manifest them into physical sensations. I would like yeah. write with that, and then also my mm -hmm. own made emotional thesaurus from sentences <laughs> that I would write down. Yeah. Yeah. So as a horror author, you definitely know how that horror is often defined by tropes and tropes are a really big, important part of horror and horror has very classic designed and used mm -hmm. tropes. I'm wording this in a really, really long way, I but how do you saying. interact with tropes as an author? <laughs> how, like, do you like writing with tropes? Do you shape stories around tropes? Do you like inverting tropes? When you started writing Ablums, did you have tropes in mind that you wanted to use or do you just kind of steer clear of any tropes? I I love tropes. I'm I'm kind of a trope fiend because I don't know. I've always put them as they're like the nicer they're like the nicer half of cliches. I love tropes. I kind of when I incorporate them, sometimes I'll just use them as for what they are, and then other times I'll try and flip them on their head. So I think going into Abrams, I kind of used this. I went with the small town mystery trope, which is very common in like movie and books like it, and you know uh, Stranger Things, obviously. Uh, I went with like the group of kids fighting evil, stuff like that. Um, and then there were other tropes that I wanted to go into and kind of flip them on their head. Like there's one character who's kind of a, she's kind of a queen bee mm -hmm. of high school. Um, but I kind of made it to where she isn't snarky or rude. She's just really adventurous and mm -hmm. wants control of her own fate. So I think with, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a mix. Other tropes I use, I like to keep them and leave them preserved how they are. And then others I like to kind of dissect and dabble with and rework them so they fit the story yeah. yeah well I think I mean there's a lot of power in tropes when because people who love reading horror often come to expect them I think and they're mm -hmm. a weird mix of familiar and new if you're able to put a new spin on a trope so people feel yeah. like oh, they've, they're really comfortable reading the book and they already really like it because I already like that trope but then this is fresh and exciting at the same time it's cool yeah it's a nice blend. It's not too stale or trite, but it's also not too outside the box and, you know, outlandish, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you have like a top five list of your favorite horror tropes of all time? I know you already mentioned a couple. Yeah. So obviously the ones I mentioned, like the, you know, uh, this group of kids, small town. I love the final girl trope. I feel like that's so yeah, basic, same. but the final girl trope is just, it never gets old. I don't know. I love this. I just love the overall slasher trope, like, you know, masked killer kind of hunting down a bunch of ignorant teens. Like that's kind of another trope I love. And then another trope I've used, or I, I have to stop myself from using actually so much is the kid with supernatural powers trope. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> I have that. And that's an Abrams. And I'm kind of like, it, I did it a good way. I did it. So it didn't like feel ripped off, but I'm like, oh, I can't use that every time. Um, do you have any book ideas now that you're playing around and toying around with writing around those favorite tropes? I have a couple. They're in my inbox, oh, not inbox, my like folder right now that among other works that I've started since Abrams, but I have a couple that I love to incorporate. I love just like, a, I think another trope I'd go for is the back in time trope, I guess. The books set like the 70s and 80s that are like horrors, I just, I'm a sucker for it. I love them. Oh yeah, so, the covers are so cool too for like the 70s yeah. and 80s horror. Yeah. So I'm definitely, that That probably comes from my love of Stephen King that I'm obsessed with like 80s, 70s, 60s kind of horror mm -hmm. because I definitely try and incorporate those as much as I can. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. I know that this is kind of a terrible qu question for writers and as a writer myself, I hate getting this question, but where do you come up with your ideas? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'm inspired by a lot of, I, I have a lot of favorites, like pieces of media that I constantly take in. And then I just kind of take inspiration from those. 
-hmm. I think when I started writing Ablums, I was going through my, my Stranger Things, you know, it chapter two had just come out in theaters. So I was very inspired there. Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of branched off into its own thing. So I do, I take my inspiration from uh, movies, TV shows, books, you know, and then I work with them until they're something that's my own and doesn't feel like a regurgitated piece of something. So do you like to outline your books in advance? I do, definitely. I'm a, I'm a hardcore plotter. I think if I, I've, I've tried to pants novels in the past without outlining, but it always kills me because I, I peter out after a couple pages. Mm-hmm. So me too. I always I, get stuck I, around the middle. Like I, I just like yeah, I it's it's the, yeah, it's the saggy middle syndrome. It gets me. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I have to I have to outline everything. I have to outline character arcs, story arcs, subplots. It just it helps me organize the what I want to happen a lot better. Yeah. So I would yeah, I definitely do. Do you have a specific method that you like to use for outlining? I do. I use the save the cat almost every time because mm-hmm. I mean. That's like the, I know there's like the three act structure and the hero's journey and stuff, but Save the Cat has always been kind of, it molds around what I want my stories to be. Because when I write, I always strive to have a cinematic kind of book that feels like a, it feels like a movie essentially. So I do use the Save the Cat a lot. I I like, I just like the structure of, you know, introduction, catalyst, you know, bad guys close in and then resolution. It's so helpful to me. Yeah. Do you write everything down in like a scene by scene outline or do you outline chapter by chapter? I do chapter more. I don't, I, I, with scenes, I kind of improvise a little with scenes because I do leave myself a little bit of leeway to tweak what I want to tweak Yeah. because I may make an outline one night and then wake up and realize that I don't want the story to be like that. And, you know, at that point it's not too late. I can go in and change it and stuff. So I, I outline by chapters and then when it comes to scenes, I'm more minute and just kind of uh, let the story unfold there to a certain degree. Have you ever started writing a project and just found that your outline like halfway through just wasn't going to happen or like you completely deviated from it in some weird way? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I would I would try and name a specific project, but I have so many and I guess it's a blessing. Sometimes it's it, it feels like the end of the world. But then when you look at it, you're like, oh, OK, well, the outline wasn't so good. So I made something better out of a horrible outline. So. it's cool how like the there is an interplay between outlining and then also discovery writing so you can outline something and then you discover something as you're writing that can change your outline it's an organic process and they speak to yeah. each other it's not like you're tied in once you outline anything oh absolutely because even then I feel a little strangled when I try and do that I'm like oh I, this this would fit perfectly I just it's too late because I wrote the outline right so yeah I definitely like discovery writing if any like mixed in with my outlines and stuff. Are there any plot beats that are connected to the horror genre that you always like to include? Like, are there certain beats that you think are really important to make sure that you nail in horror compared to other genres? Or are there special different plot beats that only apply to horror? I do think that. I mean, I've tried to dissect and research like the 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 story structure of most thrillers and horrors and stuff, because I know they kind of operate differently than most genres. I think with certain plot beats, you just have to find a way to wrap them around the story structure of your novel. Because mm-hmm. um, like with the bad guys closing, obviously the villain doesn't have to close in at that spot, like at that point in the story, but you need to show that like impending doom and the stakes are rising on that character. Because that's what really builds that, like your heart rate getting up and stuff. So I think if writers really want to not take it, you, you can't really take it literal and just find a way to you know, molded around the story that you want to tell, you know, not a lot of people know about the the dissection of a horror structure. And that's kind of sucks because you're like, I guess I'm on my own. Like, I feel a little stranded when I don't find anything about that. Yeah, so. well, horror is also such a broad genre. Like a lot of thrillers can also be considered horror. Like there's a lot mm-hmm. of overlap between them because there are all sorts of different types of horror stories and horror books that there isn't necessarily one structure that you necessarily have to follow, which is also pretty amazing. Yeah. So when you are writing horror, it is important to keep readers turning pages and keeping you know your story fast paced in order to have them want to know what happens and have them want to know mm-hmm. what happens to the characters at the end. How do you manage pacing your books? Is there a certain way that you like to pace? Is that, does that also connect to plot structure and making sure that your plot fits around a certain structure? Pacing, I think, I mean, this is kind of like the, you know, the pot calling the kettle black, but pacing has always been a little bit of a, I've always been really flawed with my pacing. I tend to underwrite when I write first drafts, Mm -hmm. but my tools that I use is usually I add in like a second 
I add a couple subplots in, in between the main stories. Cause you don't want like in horror, you don't want your pacement to be too fast. Cause then the reader doesn't get to digest what's going on, you know? Right. And to understand, to like, to be scared by horror, you have to understand why it's so scary. Like if you see a head tumbling down the stairs in a book, it's not really as scary as knowing that's like the, mo- that's the mother of the main character's head. You know what I mean? Yeah. So pacing definitely. You can't go too fast and you have to be careful not to go too slow. So I think throwing in one or two subplots that somehow will tie in or feed the main plot can also help space out what's happening in the main plot. Yeah, I have the opposite problem and always overwrite my books. And then there's just, they're too chaotic and too much is going on. And I have to always whittle them down to what's actually important. And Mm -hmm. then all of them end up being way too slow. Like, and everybody gets super bored. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, mine, <laughs> mine all happen like mine happen like breakneck speed because I I think action first, ex- explanation second. So I'll just aim for like 80,000 words and end up with like a 30,000 word novel <laughs> <laughs> because there's no story development. Do you have a point of view that you like to write in the most? Um, I definitely always write in or I try to always write in third point, third person, mm-hmm. um, whether that's limited or omniscient, because I just I like the broad. I like looking down and it's, this is a weird way to phrase it, but I like um, looking down onto this diorama of like the story and see it unfold. Um, Sometimes if the story needs to have like a one person, a first person point of view, I'll I'll write. I don't have an issue with writing in that, but Mm -hmm. my preferred is third person because you can kind of head hop and you can kind of explain stuff that's happening on the other side of town or, you know. How do you keep it? So my issue when I was always trying to write third person is that my narrative would always slip into being a little bit more telly versus showy because Mm -hmm. I would be this like omniscient person looking down at everything and I would be explaining what I'm seeing so how do you keep your third person narration like really grounded with the characters they're seeing everything that they're seeing in real time with the readers yeah so I think the first thing I do is I really cut out as many filter words as I can like uh sensation uh I tasted It tasted like, I smelled, I saw, stuff like that. Um, Now, I know a lot of writers say don't use them at all, but I really don't have an issue with using them as long as they're not overused because then they tend to feel like you're seeing it through, you know, through their eyes and not living it with them. Right. Um, I really, I think, I don't even know. I think my biggest, the biggest way I combat that is like, uh, I try and put myself in the character's shoes and what they're feeling in that moment and then translate that to their thoughts does that make sense yeah yeah like if it's if something frantic is happening I don't write long sentences with descriptions I do kind of fragments and it may not be what they're thinking but it's the point of view that I'm trying to tell and if it's something scary and in the moment it's fragmented you know it's kind of more of a a, like a I don't know like an artistic piece than an actual narration I've always found it a little bit more immersive than just telling people what I what they're seeing or what they're smelling and stuff definitely it also, I mean, it helps the instill kind of the anxious feeling within the readers if all of the sentences are like short and cropped and like people are wondering what's happening. So really what I want to talk to you about today is how you create and instill fear in your readers. Because when I was reading Ablums, you have a bunch of scenes in the book that are just so utterly terrifying and like read like you were watching some sort of scary horror movie. They were so visual and you were able mm-hmm. to pull off jump scares almost in your prose that were just super effective. So yeah. I was wondering if you had any tips or strategies for going about approaching and instilling this kind of visual fear in your mm-hmm. writing, because you can't really rely on visual jump scares and stuff in your prose. You have to try to convey them in writing because people are just like, they have yeah. to imagine it themselves. So how mm-hmm. do you get people to imagine the scary things that you're describing in your writing? Number one, I would say that it's atmospheric. Mm-hmm. I think um, if you can really set the stage and more so to like, um, explain that a little bit more it's like isolate your characters I know that's a very common trope in horror but like the less people there are the more scary it tends to be and I've always seen horror as horror and thriller differ because thriller is what will happen and how like how can I stop it and Mm -hmm. horror is knowing what's coming and not being able to stop it I definitely think that's it and then there's the fear of if anything I think it was H.P. Lovecraft that said humans fear the unknown the most Mm -hmm. so the more you keep Uh, the more you keep withheld from the readers, the scarier it can be, but be careful not to keep too much because then you're you're just, you're not giving them anything to bite. So, and then there's some other authors this week talk about that too. It's like allowing the readers to fill in the gaps with their mind. Yeah. Because if, you know, if 
the more vague you keep it, the individual reader can fill that gap, those gaps with their own personal fears. If you don't tell them what's in the closet, you just tell them something's in the closet. The, the person that's scared of clowns will think there's a clown in the closet or the person that's scared of spiders will think. So it's, it's all about filling the gaps and just appeasing to those fears. Yeah. So I think that's what I would definitely say is the trick to horror is it's like a play of its own. You have to start with like the buildup and then finally the big climax in that scene, which is when the evil thing is revealed mm -hmm. and then the resolution like do they die from it do they get hurt or do they escape it in time so right I think that's definitely the the key to creating like a terrifying scene and you mentioned earlier that one of the most important elements of horror is the emotional connection that the readers will feel to the characters because as you know you said with the, the example of the head the head rolling down the stairs is not going to hit as hard <laughs> as if it's the head of the main character's mom so yeah. how do you balance establishing that reader connection without or a reader connection to the characters without spending so much time on it, then your readers get pulled out of the story? Do you have ways that you can kind of have that happen at the same time as the horror parts? I do. I, I like I like to do breather scenes in between. So like a good horror is usually written with horror scenes in between uh, character development. Mm -hmm. If you always have it, if you, if the book's always scary, you're going to feel heavy and dark and be like, or even then you're going to be kind of immune to the scariness because you're like, this has been going on for 50 pages. So the way I do it is I usually break scary scenes into certain chapters and stuff. And then the gaps in between I use to show character interactions or develop uh, relationships or like even after, of, even after like right after the main characters have escaped some type of evil mm -hmm. they're able to swap their theories and stuff it kind of builds this relationship so like breather scenes in between scary scenes and that kind of you know they also say like I've also seen advice that's like if you throw in a little bit of comedy every now and then your horror it kind of makes this horror more it hits harder because you re it reminds you that these people are human and they can laugh and smile and stuff. Yeah, definitely the best horror stories are the ones that are able to have humor and dark stuff because then also mm -hmm. you feel for the characters when they yeah. get their heads cut off and stuff. It's, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> what is your best piece of advice for somebody that wants to be a horror author? I mean, I've always sworn by this. I think I actually said it like something like it in my other interview with you was mm -hmm. that basically don't rely on other people, like for real. Because I, as teen authors, it's very hard for people to take you seriously because you're a teenager and a lot of good ideas get overlooked because people don't believe in that. A, people think that a certain age group has to be, you know, Mm -hmm. teenagers aren't allowed to have good ideas because they are teenagers so it's I think if you really want if someone really wants to be a like a teen author or even like a young adult author it's a self-process you have to stick with yourself and your project and not really care about what other people think mm -hmm. until the time comes. Briar did a wonderful interview on this channel talking about self-publishing a book as a teenager so we're gonna not go into it as much here because this is more about horror writing and craft stuff but if you're interested yeah. and if you are a young author who wants to self-publish books definitely go check out that video I've linked it in the description of this one and also it'll be in the cards um yeah no that's it's really very inspiring and important just being able to believe in yourself and your story is really mm -hmm. the most important first step that you have yeah. when you're pursuing writing and also writing Absolutely. a lot too. Like if, if, yeah. if you're writing a lot, you're already a writer and yep. you can get a book published yourself. You can do it all yourself and there's mm -hmm. no, nothing standing between you and publication now, which is amazing. Absolutely. It's, it's opened the, it's opened the door to lots of great ideas. So you're not really streamlined to the very few that get to get published. Anyone can get published, yeah. which awesome. is, it's, it's a good thing in most cases because you get to see a lot of stuff you haven't seen before. Finally, what do you think is the secret to scaring your readers in your horror? I know that you touched on this a little bit already, but if you had to pick one thing. I, if I had to pick one thing out of, out of all that, it's to make your reader care about your character. I can't even name how many times that I've been scared of it, scared of something because of what could happen to the people that are being put in that position, you know? Yeah, definitely. So if you have a really lovable character and they're like facing a life or death moment, you're really going to be a lot more scared because you don't like seeing this person doesn't deserve it you know mm -hmm. so that's definitely my ultimate overarching like advice for that yeah likability is hard though do you have any tips for writing likable characters I think make the if you have a lot of personally my way to build likable characters is to have a lot of give them a show them in action being a good person you know like the comic relief is is that's a really likable character if done well because you can make them snappy and witty and almost borderline mean but mm -hmm. underneath all that 
it's kind of another trope that they're like this sweetheart who actually cares about everyone in the group. So it's, it's all about just, you know, humanizing them. It's a case by case. You can't really like take one thing and apply it to all your characters. You kind of just have to look into what makes each character a good person and exploiting that. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, those are all the questions that I have. Thank you so much awesome. for joining me on the channel today. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online and find your books? Yeah. For sure. So my book is on Amazon now in paperback, ebook, and hardback. Um, hardback is amazing. It looks so good. <laughs> thank you. I'm very proud of it. Uh, um, I'm also on Instagram as just Briar Esterline, and I'm on Facebook too, um, and TikTok as just all three are Briar Esterline. I kept it really easy. But um, I also have a website, and that's also Briar Esterline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you if you just I can be found anywhere if anyone's interested and my books can be found at the simplest search on Amazon or online or whatever, or even through my website, it makes it easier. So definitely I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do too. It's the perfect read for spooky season. Everybody should go pick up a copy of Friar's book. <laughs> I second <All> right. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much again for joining me on the channel today. Thank you all for watching. <laughs> Thanks for having me.